So in your talk, I thought one of the most interesting things was uh, prognosticating about uh, Moore's law and finding a limitation. Can you say a bit more about what that uh, result is? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 the, of course, we all know that physics is ultimately going to provide some constraints on Moore's law. What's amazing is how long we've avoided those. Every time you thought you reached a limit, we find a new physical way of, of, a, of doubling memory, storage, and speed. Um, but what is fascinating to me, it was fascinating to me, is that you know, ultimately cosmology, the universe, provides a limit on what we can do by the energetics of the universe. But normally when you think about that, and I have thought about that, the limits on the future of life, etc., are astronomical, literally and metaphorically. In their, in, in, but if you, when you consider Moore's law, which of course is exponential, and you look at the constraint on, uh, that we have calculated on the total number of bits that you can process at a finite temperature, with error correction, which requires dissipation. What is amazing is, uh, is a, it, the first number we got was 400 year lifetime on an advanced civilization, which really impacts, it seems to me, if you like to think about science fiction, on how long civilizations can continue this domination of inf by information processing of sort of exponential growth. Of course, it, it's, it is surprising, but it's not that surprising because, you know, e to the 400 is a big number. <laughs> And uh, and so it's it 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 but it is sobering to think that it definitely implies a, a change, a fundamental change, especially if you're thinking of the future and singularities and other things. You can't extrapolate a billion years into the future and say, you know, this continues on and we become the, like the characters in a Star Trek movie uh, with some superhuman intelligence that's beyond come beyond uh, our imagination. And I, I found it fascinating. It's some simple physics, and it looks. It looks impossible to avoid. If, oh, if we live in a universe that indeed has this energy of empty space, which that's the one criteria, because that puts a lower limit on the temperature to which you can cool things. If you can cool things more, you don't need much energy to process information. Hmm. Anyway, so it's, I found it amusing that cosmology actually gives a, a limit that's on a human time scale. Yeah. yeah. Also thinking sort of into the distant future, uh, to what extent do you think um, advanced versions of ourselves will be able to engineer some of these uh, physics? Um, well, I, I think uh, it's a fascinating question of whether once, once, whether we'll continue to do physics the same way as we develop machine intelligence. We already are doing physics differently, and you're and you and I, we were talking about it earlier. In some sense. Mathematica as a tool mm -hmm. has changed the way, uh, w in many ways, we do physics. Uh, the kind of questions we ask are not as limited by our computational uh, constraints, algebraic and otherwise. And so we ask questions about things that we would never have thought of doing before as a matter of course. And um, uh, so, so that mathematical complexity is not the con major constraint now on our thinking about physics problems. Hmm. So that's already changed things a little bit. But I think much more dramatically, of course, the question is when you have a machine intelligence, uh, as, as I think I said the other night, uh, as my friend Frank Welchick I said, would, will computers do physics the same way that we do physics? And it's a fascinating question. And, and again, if, if, if they can probe in some sense if the machines themselves in some ways are based on quantum processes, will they have a different understanding of quantum processes? I, you know, I'm more dubious about that, but it's an interesting question. I wonder if you might speculate on, you know, Eugene Bigner talked about the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in describing the physical world. And what you're saying now suggests that maybe with sufficiently intelligent machines, there might be mathematics that we don't regard as simple. Um, do you think that's likely? Well, or? you know, I think, I think it's... Um, you know, Wigner's essay on the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics is a fascinating thing. It's true. We had no right reason to expect that mathematics would provide such a beautiful description, that it would be the language of nature, that it's the right way to describe things, and that, and that the things we invent with our minds often, although not always, I think it's important to stress, often have overlap in the real universe. But I think at the same time it's not so surprising anymore because we kind of realize that the playing field of physics is determined by the symmetries of nature, and symmetries are mathematical quantities, and so they restrict what's possible and what isn't. And uh, it's hard for me to imagine 
that that aspect of, of, of why mathematics is such a good language for nature will change if when we have machine intelligence. How we frame it and um, how we uh, both explore and uh, and explain in a mathematical sense may change dramatically, I guess. And so, I mean, and as may also the questions of interest. So it's hard to know. And you know, you ask. If you thought about the world differently, what would, how would you think about the world? And the answer is, well, if I thought about the world differently, I'd know. But, but, uh, but it's certainly possible to imagine that the kind of questions that are of interest will change. But I would be very surprised if and symmetry has, been a, a, has really come down to being the way to describe nature. And it, it just, once you know the symmetries of nature, the physics is constrained. And it's hard for me to imagine that will change even with machines. But you never know. Do you think the exceptional groups play some special role, or is that just a... Uh, well, you know, what, what, what is surprising is how amazingly nature seems to exploit advanced mathematics, even when you don't think it's relevant. And so, uh, it's almost like what I say about the physical universe is anything that isn't impossible, it happens somewhere. And, it, and maybe one could say that about mathematically, anything you can write down mathematically at some level gets exploited, but you know, it's not 100% true. And, and the nice, you know, I, at the end of one of my books, Hiding in the Mirror, I, um, I uh, gave a quote from Herman Weil, who's a famous mathematical physicist, who said, in my work I'm often forced to choose between uh, uh, the true and the beautiful, and whenever I do, I choose the beautiful. <laughs> and math, that's a luxury that mathematicians are allowed, but physicists aren't. The world tells us what's true, and whether it's beautiful or not, uh, that's, that's not for us to say. What's your intuition about where quantum gravity is going? <laughs> well, I have no intuition about it. It's, what's clear is that, is that uh, it's a very difficult nut to crack, not just because of the mathematical problems, but because we, have, we are guided in, in physics, even in theoretical physics, not by mathematics, but by, by experiment. And, and it's hard to imagine experiments that will constrain us. So, I think it's anyone's bet. I, um, in some sense, I hope that the ideas of string theory are right because I find the existence of extra dimensions, although they're fascinating in one sense, to be highly um, ugly. I think, and so uh, I just don't know. I mean, obviously, if I knew where, where quantum gravity was going, I'd be I'd be going there. Hmm. My argument for many things. Uh, I, I think uh, I think there's still new f string theory was one new idea and, it's, and, I, and in all fairness it was the best new idea around for a long time but, but I think we need some new, more new ideas. Hmm. What technologies you see on the horizon do you think might have the biggest impact on physics? Well, I think, I think that our ability to manipulate single atoms and quantum systems and engineer quantum systems is probably profound importance in physics. It's going to affect our ability to do biophysics, genetic engineering, but also build new materials and, and explore the quantum universe. So I think that's probably the most exciting new forms of technology is our ability to manipulate quantum systems on maybe on a macroscopic scale. To me, I think that's probably the most exciting new technological uh, possible breakthroughs that are going to happen. Some of your fascinating work has combined uh, early cosmology with particle physics. Yeah. Um, is there is there more more to be mined in that? Or? Well, I think so. I mean, the point is that that uh, the reason that particle physics and cosmology are are relevant together is that the universe is a particle physics experiment at some level. Mm -hmm. The Big Bang. At early enough times, the, you know, I like to say the experiment's been done. It's just data analysis. Uh, there are many things for which we may have no direct empirical handle on Earth because we can't build accelerators that are big enough. And so the universe provides us, in principle, with that kind of accelerator, or had, did. And, and can we probe and find remnants in the structures we see today that tell us what happened at the beginning of time? And I think there's probably a lot we still, well, there's no doubt a lot we need to learn. And there's some fundamental things we, we sort of think we understand but don't really understand, like why there is more matter in the universe than antimatter. So there are questions, fundamental questions that remain to be solved, and of course, the nature, the fact that empty space has energy is, is the ultimate connection between particle physics and, 
and and cosmology, it just we just don't know what the connection is. What's your view on multiverse uh, models of the universe? Well, I, I, and I've just finished a new book where I talk about that at length at the end, but. Um, uh, most of the current ideas that in extending our picture of physics from the early universe, the idea of inflation, the period of exponential expansion in the early universe, to the ideas of string theory, all naturally predict the possibility that our universe is not unique. And in fact, moreover, that the laws of physics in other universes and may not be the same. Now, we've had to redefine what we need, mean by universe. It, listeners may think that that's just an oxymoron or something where you talk about many universes, but um, but now we tend to describe, universe used to mean everything. And now I think we're, we have a much more reasonable operational definition of universe, which is everything we could see once or could always see in, or see in the future. Anything we could have ever been in contact with and anything we can ever be in contact with. And, and it's clear that, that even if that's infinitely big, there could be other infinitely big regions that, for which we'll never be in contact. And it makes sense to call them other universes. And in those other universes, there could be easily be other laws of physics. It's not something that's invented to get around philosophical problems with our universe. It's something that arises naturally in most physical models. So I think it's not implausible that there's a multiverse. I, there are implications of that that some people draw that I find problematic, although they may be true, and that is that, that indeed there's no fundamental laws of physics, that physics is an environmental accident, mm. <clears throat> and, and it will be and it is what it is because we're here to measure it and so we select out a certain subset of physical constants that allow us to exist by our by the fact that we're here to ask the question and I don't you know it may that may be the answer I, I find it so I find the idea of a multiverse natural but some of the anthropic implications of that I find distasteful but that doesn't mean they're not right you've done a lot of work on uh, dark energy and dark matter uh, do you have a sense of how our understanding of that is going to unfold? Well, dark matter, I'm pretty pretty confident that we'll understand the nature of dark matter in, in, in this generation because of a whole bunch of experiments that are going on to look for it. And I think, we'll, I think it is undoubtedly a new form of elementary particle, and we just have to think of different ways to detect these new forms of elementary particles and using tricky methods. So I think we'll, we'll get an empirical handle on that. And maybe at the Large Hadron Collider, we'll learn enough about particle physics to get an a theoretical handle and make a prediction, but dark energy I'm much more, I'm much less sanguine about. I, 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 I think it's quite possible we won't understand the nature of dark energy for a long, long time. It's really weird, and we may need to understand quantum gravity, and we may. It's, it's, I don't think we'll learn anything about it experimentally in the near future. And any region where we can't learn anything experimentally, I'm more, I'm more, I'm more pessimistic about ultimately understanding. It is the weirdest thing in the universe, and it makes no sense. And and that's great if you're a theorist, but at the same time, um, it's a long road to hoe to think we might actually understand it. How do you think physics education is going to change? Do you, do you think there are new ways of conveying these complex concepts in a way that people can learn them more easily? Well, I think being able to, you know, mathematically be able to do, one of the things that computers have helped to some extent is allow people to build intuition from equations that they couldn't before, to draw things and to be able to see things and, and operate with them and, and build computer models that give you some intuition that we didn't have before. So I think our computational ability will, uh, will allow people to, to, have, um, to build kinds of intuition they wouldn't have been able to build otherwise. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm also, maybe it's because I'm old, I tend to think that um, um, you know, every generation wants to revolutionize the way we teach physics. <laughs> And, you know, it's worked pretty well. I mean, it's not worked well for the... For, I, I, we have to do a better job of, of, of teaching physics to, the, to those people who aren't going to be physicists, to understand what the key concepts are and why we do it. But to those people who are going to be physicists, I think the, there's no substitute for solving a lot of problems, again, building up intuition that way and, and learning, learning how we explore the universe. And that, that's... Maybe, it's an oldie but a goodie in terms of... Uh, in terms of education techniques. But I think what we have to stop doing is thinking that everyone we're going to train is going to be a physicist. We have to get out of that mentality of creating clones, because most people aren't. We have to think, what is it that's really important that we want to teach them? And it isn't how things go down in climb planes. It's how to take complicated problems and break them down and make them simple, and, and when, how to throw out irrelevant stuff, and, and how to um, 
make approximations and, and all sorts of things that will be useful for people and the nature of uncertainty and all sorts of and, and how you disprove things all the, the, the kind of things that really be essential for people in their daily lives no matter what field or area of human activity they're involved in. At the summit you mentioned some ideas about the Fermi paradox. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, depends on the day like many things whether I'm optimistic or pessimistic. Fermi paradox as you know basically says if there are aliens out there how come we haven't seen them and although except for the few people who've been abducted by them here. <laughs> but um, because in principle if you thought about colonizing the galaxy in less than 10 billion years you could easily do it. If you were, if that was your goal, and there may, there may be many answers to that. One is that civilizations may not survive very long. The other is that they may not choose to uh, to to colonize the galaxy. They may go to a place and and if it's habitable, just live there. I mean, and that's often the case on Earth. I mean, if you think about physically how soon Europeans could have colonized uh, North America, it, 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 the laws of physics would have allowed it much earlier than sociologically it happened. Um, so it may be that just don't want to, um, uh, or it may be that the that 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 the limitations of space travel are such that, you know, civilizations don't move across the galaxy. But it is a question, and um, and and there are good arguments on both sides. And I'm kind of agnostic. I I'd like to think that there's lots of intelligent civilizations in the in, in the universe and maybe even in the galaxy. But I also know it's a big galaxy, and the likelihood of ever knowing that empirically to answer that question is very small. Do you think what what do you think there will be any impediments to uh, to massive technological growth in the future? Econo I think the biggest impediment will be economics, based on limitations of energy and too many people on the planet. I think that's going to be the li the biggest limitation of of doing incredible technology because we we may find we our our resources are are devoted need to be devoted to other things. Mm -hmm.